Here's NFL legend Terry Bradshaw. This is it, your last chance to win big money from Publishers Clearinghouse. There are just days left to enter to win $5,000 a week forever on February 28th. Yep, you got to enter at pch.com before it's too late. Win and you get five grand a week for your life. Then after that, someone you choose gets five grand a week for their life. Real people really win. It's your last chance to enter, people. Come on, let's go. Five grand a week forever. Last chance. Enter now at pch.com. Entries due 226. No purchase necessary. Void or prohibited. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another WTF1 podcast. It's our third, I think, of 2022. Uh, keeping count. Carry this on. You'll do this the entire year. You're going to be like, well, this it's is our 52nd 74. today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but today uh, we're going to be talking about our, the F1 driver lineups and where you, the fans, have voted uh, from 10th all the way to 1st. Uh, and then for us to chime in with our opinions too. Because, of course, we always give our opinions, whether you like it or not. Now, Tom Bellingham, the WTF1 founder, how are you feeling two months away ish? to uh lights out in in bahrain are you, are you it's coping? gonna go it's gonna go really quick we're only what like two weeks away from car launches pretty much um and it still only feels about 40 seconds since abu dhabi finished to be honest <laughs> so you're coping okay what about you yeah. katie wtf1 author annual annual writer annual writer yeah People pleaser um, with your writing well thank you <laughs> Um, yeah, it, like Tommy said, it seems only a moment ago that we had Abu Dhabi, but I'm still hyped and ready for this new season, new regs, hopefully a bit of a clean slate for a lot of things. So bring it on. Bring it on indeed. Now, before we dive into our ratings and your ratings and all that good stuff, uh, WTF1 Clubhouse is back for 2022. Yes, if you don't know what it is, it's a massive camping experience we have at Silverstone uh, where you guys can come and camp with us uh, throughout the Grand Prix weekend. Uh, If you want to join us at the British Grand Prix on our campsite with entertainment, with an F1 quiz night, with which to be fair, we didn't even know what people wanted quiz nights last year, but uh, they did. They really enjoyed it. And I really enjoyed being the quiz master. Uh, Live WTF1 podcasts, so much more. You've got simulators, all good stuff. Uh, Then head to WTF1.com forward slash clubhouse or click the link in the description to find out more. There you go. And you'll see all of us there. We'll be having a great time. Now, we created a form and asked all of you, the fans, to rate each 2022 driver lineup uh, out of 10. We then got a score out of 10 for each team based on the average. And we're going to go from worst to best and talk about each one as we go. How's that sound? You good with that, Katie? Tommy, you ready for this? Gravy. Lovely stuff. Okay, in P10. Drum roll, please. (laughs) Who could it be? (laughs) have. (laughs) Has. With 3.6 out of 10. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it's difficult to be in a car like Haas, uh, which we've seen uh, throughout last year, because they were literally a Formula 2 car in a lot of respects due to their performances. Um, Of course, Haas very much focusing towards 2022, uh, where hopefully we'll get to see more representative results and we'll be able to see what both drivers can do in wheel-to-wheel combat, potentially. Uh, but from what we saw, I think the 3.6 is very much maybe on Mick Schumacher's side as well, just pu- maybe bumping those numbers up a little bit with uh, some of the performances he did. Hungary is one that sticks in my mind of kind of getting his elbows out in that Haas. And I think he made Q2 in uh, Paul Ricard, uh, but then he did crash after that. Essentially, <laughs> 3.6 is quite fair, but I think also these ratings can get roped in a little bit with the car performance. So it's, uh, I guess it's, it's the lineup as a whole and... Um, yeah, it's, we just haven't seen it, have we? We just haven't seen anything yet but crashes from both of them a lot last year, which would have cost us quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned there Schumacher maybe bumping up the score a bit, but in my opinion, maybe Schumacher will be bringing the score down with the amount that he crashed and the amount that he would have cost Hass in crash damage last year. I saw a, a graphic, I don't know, I don't think it was officially from F1, but Schumacher was the driver that apparently caused the most amount of uh, costly damage on his car out of the whole grid last year, which doesn't surprise me because he did have quite a few offs. Um, so not great. Hopefully you can iron that out. But yeah, Haas is a duo, obviously Mick Schumacher, Nikita Mazepin, both rookies in 2021. Um, and although, you know, they're both young, talented drivers, we've seen great performances from them in their junior careers. Um, they're still rookies at the end of the day. And I have a 
really bad feeling that because they're so young and inexperienced within the F1 bubble um, that, you know, giving feedback on the car and stuff like that, you're not going to have the same amount of knowledge and expertise than if, you know, they kept Roman Grosjean or Kevin Magnussen um, and partnered him with a rookie. So yeah, very fresh faced, um, new bunch of drivers uh, in a car that is definitely probably the worst on the grid. So I can see why the fans put them at the back. Yeah, I'd, hard, I'd find it hard to argue that they're not the worst driver lineup <laughs> um, in terms of, you know, they were both rookies last season. Um, Mick definitely had a lot more pace than uh, Mazepin. Um, but then, like Katie said, ended up crashing a little bit more. Um, and we did see more moments, uh, definitely, uh, you know, from from Mick. But I still think he's a little bit, uh, obviously, well, he is fact uh, inexperienced. Um, but also, he, he's always been one of those drivers as well that uh, throughout his career, he seems to sort of, get better after a few seasons Take, not, he takes a year to warm up does. Tommy. yeah i wasn't gonna put my shoemy hat, fa, uh, fanboy hat on just yet but yes yeah he takes a because year to warm up. Uh, f- f- he's not he's not like that driver like leclerc verstappen norris russell where they seem to go just straight in and it's like oh my god wow this guy's amazing he, he's m- maybe science you could put under that bracket where like a lot of people have now started to discover oh my god you know now, now he's got more experience under his belt and we posted a graphic about science where you know his his point scoring and stats have gone up Mick Schumacher seems more like that kind of driver that uh does a lot better after a, a second season so yeah I think hopefully if the house is better we might actually get to see something from them because it's so hard to judge uh <laughs> how good they are when they're essentially racing no one it's a bit like Williams a couple of years ago where you just go well how how can you grade this when they're 19th and 20th every race pretty much yeah very very difficult to to rate but alas <laughs> came out 10th by uh, <laughs> quite a substantial margin uh, i really do hope to see Haas uh, a bit further up the field at least closer to the back of the field i think that would be a good result but they have been preparing the entirety of 2021 so really no excuses and they have the most wind tunnel time and every everything that they could possibly need for 22 uh, they've got right that's P10, done and dusted. 3.6 out of 10 for Haas. Now on to ninth. And I'm a little bit surprised by this one. Quite savage, in my opinion. But uh, ninth goes to Alfa Romeo with 4.8 out of 10. Now, of course, that is Valtteri Bottas and Guan Yu Zhou, uh, the pairing. And I'm surprised Bottas didn't bump up the numbers a little bit more here with mm. his experience. Um, I still rate Bottas as a driver. I think that Mercedes, you know, whatever happened there, especially... Uh, last year it just wasn't really working for him. But Bottas is still a very good driver and on his day can be incredibly good. So maybe it's, again, Guan Yu Zhou being completely new, not many people rating him. I think Tommy's been on this defence a little bit over some podcasts saying that some people are treating him like he's a bus driver coming into Formula One. That's not quite uh, what <laughs> Guan Yu Zhou is. But um, again, there's, there's very little hype around Zhou really joining in terms of his potential. But I think the pair of them, Bottas, can obviously teach uh, Joe quite a lot uh, in the world of Formula One. And I, I think that's slightly unfair. I wouldn't have put them ninth, in my opinion. Yeah. Guan Yu Zhou is obviously unknown because he's a rookie. Um, I feel like he probably comes into um, the sport as kind of like a, maybe Latifi, who's a bit better now, but you don't you don't put him under, obviously, like a future world champion and loads of hype around him. Um but certainly not as bad as a lot of people seem to say. And I totally agree with you about Bottas. Um, you know, we've not been <laughs> the kindest to him when he's in a Mercedes. And, you know, you have to perform when you're in a top team. But he's certainly not as bad as a lot of people uh, seem to think. And qualifying especially, I feel like we we'll might see the good performances. His race craft is not really there. You know, we've seen that so much. But in terms of, you know, you're not a bad driver if you can out-qualify and beat Hamilton in even just one race in your entire career in the same car so um yeah I I agree with you actually I would put them personally uh ahead of Williams but um <gasps> spoiler clearly, alert clearly we don't know we don't know uh, if Williams is P8 or not we haven't decided yet well this we is... don't know yet but we'll find out <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I I would I I feel like probably a step too low for me yeah I'm in the, the same boat as you guys I think I'd put them a bit higher than this like you say Guan Yu Zhou Yes, he's 
not, you know, won the F2 championship or anything like this. And there's always going to be comparisons to people like Piastri, who, you know, people argue should have been in that seat and stuff. So he's kind of started on the back foot already, probably feeling like there's a lot of F1 fans that don't think he deserves the seat or that kind of thing. But he's still, you know, quick, talented young driver. And I'm always happy to see, you know, fresh faces and new blood in the sport. I think it's a good thing and healthy for the sport. And obviously being Chinese as well is excellent. Just get a bit of variety on the grid, being the first Chinese driver to to compete in a Formula One Grand Prix, which is very exciting. Um, but yeah, with Bottas, you know, the guy's a 10-time race winner. He's not, you know, he, he had a bit of a yo-yo year last year, you know, comparing his results like Hungary, which was just absolute carnage, disaster, probably wants to erase that Grand Prix from his memory. But then looking at Monza, for example, after he was announced that he was going to Alpha, for me, that was possibly one of the best performances out of any driver on the grid at all of 2021, you know, managing to get the unofficial pole on Friday and then super, uh, what's it called? Sprint race uh, victory pole thing, (laughs) whatever everyone (laughs) have decided to title it now. Um, And then obviously being given the penalty, having to start from the back and then fighting his way up and getting on the podium. I think that's such an underrated performance. But yeah, uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing how Valtteri is going to get on being a number one at a team because with Mercedes for so long, he has been that wingman, that number two driver. And although there's been a bit of... um, people not liking calling him a wingman, you know, we, we all know that was the role that he was playing there to Lewis Hamilton. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him departing Mercedes, spreading his wings, becoming that dominant person in the garage out of the two drivers and hopefully shaping Alfa Romeo back into a more competitive team because um, maybe it's the, the same driver lineup they had with Giovinazzi and Raikkonen, but they became just quite stagnant. And, you know, like when we're on the podcast giving them grades, it was like, just give them a C because we didn't really see them do anything. So hopefully with a, a new lineup there, um, it'll be the shakeup that they need. Yeah, I, I, I sincerely hope Bottas will be a bit more motivated than maybe we saw with Kimi Raikkonen and, and his uh, younger compatriot of Antonio Giovinazzi. That partnership didn't really work too well. And I think it's because Kimi very much saw this as his last couple of years of just bants and just flying around the world and driving fast cars. So, uh, I, yeah, I hope that uh, Alfa Romeo uh, do take a step forward. So that's 4.8 out of 10 for them and P9. Uh, coming in in P8, as uh, as told by Tommy, but only by point one of a point. You never know, they could have been nine. first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with 4.9 out of 10 uh, is Williams uh, in P8. And of course, that is Alex Alban and Nicholas Latifi. Felt like they deserved P9, to be honest with you. Uh, I think that obviously there's a lot of love for Alex Alban in the community. And I think that, um, you know, everyone wants to see him do well. You know, his time at Red Bull was pretty bad and ended very abruptly and it was very it was unfair of course for him to drop completely out of formula one uh, because there was no seats available um but he's now getting his time once again to prove what he's worth maybe build up that confidence that you know the likes of pierre gasly have needed you know he pierre gasly had exactly the same experience in red bull went back to to alpha tauri and just built his his confidence and uh, the foundations from there so I, i'd like to see alex do well because i don't think he's a bad driver he just wasn't able to perform at a top team straight away, just like we saw with, with Gasly. So, um, yeah, I think Nicholas Latifi, on the other hand, he if he beats Alex Alban, that will be very bad for Alex's career. I think we've said that a few times in the podcast. Um, but it's it's a potential. You know, Nicholas has been in the sport for you know a few years now and is is getting experience under his belt and was better towards the end of the season. Maybe that's because of Russell falling off a little bit because he's thinking about the Mercedes, but. I don't think Nicholas Latifi was too bad of a driver towards the end uh, of the season. So Alex might have his, his work cut out, but brand new regs, completely clean slate. You have to think Alban will be the one to come out on top in that in that pairing. Yeah, I mean, Latifi pleasantly surprised me last year because he was another driver that kind of just disappeared into the shadows a bit at Williams when they weren't really doing anything particularly spectacular. But he's shown real you know, glimpses of of promise. Um, and like you say, Alban coming back, I'm glad that he had that year out um, because the way that, you know, he, he left that Red Bull seat was 
you know, very public and not particularly pleasant. And we've seen it a few times with Red Bull. And like you say, with Gasly, he managed to jump into another team and get his confidence back. But Albon has still had quite a vital part to play with Red Bull. Obviously, last year, um, he was reserve driver with them and helping them develop that car a bit. And it obviously paid off because they were very competitive in 2021. But yeah, it's going to be a, a pairing that I'm excited to to see how they get on. Obviously, they were teammates as well previously in F2 in 2018. And that year, Albon finished third um, in the championship. He lost out to these really unknown drivers called George Russell and Lando Norris, I think it is. Um, but Nicholas Latifi finished that year ninth. So quite a, quite a difference. Both won races um, in that year. But yeah, it was Albon who came out on top. So it'd be interesting to see if where Nicholas knows he's got Williams support and he's been there for a few years now. This will be his third year with Williams. He knows the team. He's got that to his advantage, whereas Albon's very much coming in as the new kid, even if he does have F1 experience. So, yeah, I think I would probably switch Alfa Romeo and Williams in this list. But, I mean, it was by such a minute <laughs> difference, wasn't it? Like a one decimal point uh, difference. So, yeah, very excited to see how Williams get on. I feel like Albon. I'm really surprised they went for Albon. I hope he. I hope he proves me wrong. Um, and I think he's a lot better driver than uh, obviously he could show at Red Bull because we've seen Gasly, even even Perez. Obviously, he's done better. Um, still, can't get anywhere near Max. And obviously, there's the talk of whether that's because they're a completely one driver focused team and the seats cursed or whatever. So. Albon, for a team like Williams to go for for Albon when they're trying to you know build something, um, it's a really interesting hire because he obviously left the sport with not a lot of confidence, uh, and he's come back in and then uh, with with Latifi they don't they don't really have like a strong. This is why I think Alpha are better because, like Bottas, is that experienced driver, you know, like a really experienced driver that's in a seat. Um, and again, it kind of goes <laughs> the same with Haas. They've got sort of two younger drivers, um, and that clearly hasn't worked. So we'll see. But yeah, I agree with you guys. I'm surprised um, Williams uh, pipped Alpha, but I think that's like <laughs> Matt's kind of alluded to is a. Uh, Albon being very popular and Bottas maybe not so popular. This is not a popularity contest, I <laughs> promise. This is the ratings, but uh, yeah. So Williams P8 with 4.9 out of 10. We now move to P7 and Aston Martin with 5.6 out of 10. Now, of course, that is the lineup of Lance Stroll and Sebastian Vettel once again. And yeah, difficult season for Aston Martin last year, wasn't it? You know, they were slow for quite a bit of the season. They had, you know, odd moments of of pace, but generally speaking, especially towards the end of the season, they just really began to be nowhere. Um, as for the lineup itself, Lance Stroll didn't really have, considering all the craziness, you'd expect Lance Stroll to get a crazy result because that's what we've seen in prior years, you know, getting pole position at Turkey or getting a podium at Baku and, and things like that. You know, he's, he's got a few podiums under his belt from crazy races, but... Lance Stroll didn't really show that from uh, last year. I keep thinking it's 21 at the moment, but it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the new year, Matt. And of course, Sebastian Vettel, four-time world champion, uh, is probably boosting that number a bit up as well. Uh, 5.6 out of 10. Yeah, it's difficult again, because I think there is there is obviously an emphasis on the car performance as well. Uh, but, you know, I think Seb definitely showed still got potential. You know, that, that hungry drive... Uh, you know, racing down Esteban Ocon, of course, you know, Baku as well uh, and things like that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be it's, these teams like Aston Martin, like Haas, like Williams, they're, they're all going to be difficult to judge unless they're really fighting in that midfield. Uh, I think there's definitely potential with, with Lance Stroll and Sebastian Vettel to be right up there with, with, with the other teams, just on talent alone. Lance Stroll's no pushover. You know, he's had this, oh, he's the rich kid and all this, but he is genuinely talented you know he has podiums under his belt and he wouldn't get that through money it's not like he's got an extra 20 <laughs> horsepower because Lance or sorry Lawrence Stroll's bought a different engine for him um but yeah I think 5.6 out of 10 is maybe a little bit harsh but judging on last season I can see why people uh voted it yeah I feel like Stroll again is probably bringing the rating down a little bit um you've got 
an extremely popular driver in Sebastian Vettel uh, and maybe not quite so popular driver uh, in the community as Lance Stroll. For me, Stroll manages to be almost the most underrated driver ever and also kind of overrated driver ever because I see nothing on Twitter, but either he's awful and shouldn't be an F1 and he's rubbish or like some people that think he's like Verstappen, Hamilton uh, level, which in my opinion, no, I think he's just Mm. good. Um, I think he's good and decent, but no one seems to just say he's just decent. Uh, there, there definitely just seems <laughs> to be. The other. <laughs> it is literally like he's a proper like marmite driver, but um, yeah, he's he's decent enough. And uh, obviously, Vettel is a four-time world champion, uh, even if he's not in his uh, prime anymore. But again, you know, it, it kind of comes down to the car. Uh, look at 2018 when he was at Ferrari and he was um, challenging Hamilton for the title, and then things changed, and then the 2020 Ferrari wasn't very good. And now everyone's talking about how he's completely fallen off. So the car does have a lot to do with it. Um, but again, like you're right, these, these teams are kind of hard to judge because there are a lot of drivers where you're like the car, the driver. Um, mm. But I think it's still, it's still a decent lineup. I, I think it's probably just so low down because there are better ones. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I was thinking like seventh is quite, harsh for you know a four-time world champion and like you say Lance Stroll is a strong decent driver yes he didn't have the shock results that we've seen him have in previous seasons in Formula One but he still you know manages to put in good performances from time to time and like you say that's nothing to do with money he has got raw talent there Um, but then you look at the other ones that are still to come and you're like oh but actually maybe they have got a stronger line. Like it's quite difficult to place them. So I, I don't envy the the fans that were voting in this at all. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's still a, a good lineup. I mean, with Sebastian, obviously he got the podium in Baku, which was excellent and very well-deserved. Um, and then in Hungary, which uh, was ultimately taken away because of a fuel issue. Um, but still, you, you could argue that maybe with his experience, he should have won that race and passed Esteban Ocon. He was on his tail for most of the Grand Prix, yet Ocon held him off. So you could say that maybe he should have should have actually had that victory. But I'm quite and then been disqualified. Yeah, I was like, I'm quite glad <laughs> that he didn't in a way because I don't think my heart could have taken that, that like disappointment. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's just a strong lineup. I mean, but as Tommy said, there are there are better, which seems mad when you put uh, Sebastian Vettel in a team and you're still there saying, yeah, there are you know people that are better on the grid, but maybe he's past his peak. Is that? I think that's fair to say. Yeah, yeah. He's, sorry, he's, sorry, Seb. No, I mean he's still got the talent, but you know you can't expect him to be in his prime still. Um, yeah, there are six other better teams according to this poll. It's the new year, which means we've all got exercise on the brain. But really, what you need is to exercise your brain. Resolve to strengthen your mind with a mindfulness practice. And just like a new gym routine, you may need a little help from a trainer. That's where Calm comes in. We're partnering with Calm, the number one mental wellness app, to give you the tools that improve the way you feel. Clear your head with guided daily meditations, improve your focus with Calm's curated music tracks and drift off to dreamland with Calm's imaginative sleep stories for children and adults. If you go to calm.com forward slash WTF1, you'll get a limited time offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of programming and new content is added every week. Over 100 million people around the world use Calm to take care of their minds. Sleep more, stress less, live better with Calm. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com forward slash WTF1. Go to calm.com slash WTF1 for 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library. That's calm.com forward slash WTF1. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like leaving your keys in your car while you run into the petrol station for a snack. Most of the time, you're probably fine. But what if you come back to see someone driving off with your car? Why does everyone need a VPN? Well, every time you connect to an unencrypted network, cafes, hotels, airports, any hacker on the same network can gain access to your personal data, passwords, financial details and so on. 
It doesn't take much technical knowledge to hack someone either. Just some cheap hardware is needed. A smart 12-year-old could do it. Your data is valuable. Hackers can make up to $1,000 per person selling personal information on the dark web. Why use an ExpressVPN? It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so hackers can't steal your sensitive data. It's super secure. It'd take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to get past ExpressVPN's encryption. It's easy to use. Fire up the app and click one button to get protected. And it works on all devices, phones, laptops, tablets and more so you can stay secure on the go. I love using ExpressVPN because I know my personal data is safe when using the internet. Secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash WTF1. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash WTF1. And you can get an extra three months free. Expressvpn.com slash WTF1. So uh, well, let's move on to P6. So Aston Martin 5.6 out of 10. Alpha Tauri comes in at P6, which I think, hmm, interesting. Tommy's rigged the voting yeah <laughs> well, no tommy's not voted enough in my opinion uh, yeah, for yeah, Sonoda. yeah. Uh, 6.2 out of 10 uh, for alpha tauri um of course pierre gasly had an amazing season uh last year i still i as much as he took a lot of headlines pierre gasly with a lot of amazing qualifying performances but when you actually look at the points mm-hmm. scored some of that may be down to race pace within the car and whatnot but alpha tauri also messing up on the strategy a lot which didn't give them potentially the maximum points in my opinion like for example the very crazy decision was it Imola where they decided to go on wet tires when everybody else was on inters yeah uh, things like that that were crazy things like they p4 on the grid i think it was and they were like yes wet tires it just wasn't they, necessary they keep trying to do this hero strategy to get a crazy which you, which you do they're... if you're knocked out in q2 or something and you you know at the back of the grid and you go right let's whack on a set of wets like Hass would do or whatever but um yeah, Alpha Tauri, I feel like Pierre Gasly obviously had an amazing season. I think he's in, a, in great form going into uh, next year. Yuki Tsunoda obviously had a brilliant result in Abu Dhabi, as I, <laughs> uh, I'm contractually obliged to mention uh, by the WCF1 founder himself. Uh, but I would, I don't know. I'm surprised they're P6, to be honest. But uh, yeah, no, I think they maybe deserve a few a, a few more percentile, percentiles. Is that the word? I don't know. You know, like dots, you know, 6.2. I, I feel like it's they deserve to be more like the 6.8, 6.9. You know what I mean? Like the the the, the, the higher percent. Anyway, um, yeah, I think that gen, gen, generally speaking, they're, they're a strong lineup. Uh, if Yuki gets his act together, he's shown he's got potential. He's just needed a, a season to harness it next year. I'm not on the I'm not the conductor of the Yuki hype train like Tom <laughs> Tommy is, but I think I think they could they could achieve some good stuff. Uh, and, you know, they've got similar parts to Red Bull coming on their car as well. Uh, So, yeah, why not? It does make me wonder if Yuki didn't have that strong result in Abu Dhabi, if this would be much, much lower. Because although Pierre's great and sometimes his performances, you know, when we were doing our quali predictions and we were putting our top five in, you could easily whack Pierre Gasly P5 and that wouldn't be a bold prediction. That would be pretty standard that he could bring the Alpha Tauri into the top five and be sort of best of the rest, really. Um, so a brilliant job from him. But he finished P9 in the driver standings, which, like we said, doesn't really feel truly representative of how much he was hyped and what a good job he did. But they just seem to fall back Alpha Tauri in the races. But, yeah, I think I would put these guys a lot lower, mainly because of Yuki. Um, because although he is a great little racer and there's no denying that he's also <laughs> incredible. No, I didn't mean that in hype. By the, way. Yeah, I, <laughs> the way you said it, I was like, oh, I, was, no. I mean, I'm also tiny and short. So, you know, me and Yuki, we're, I think actually I'm smaller than Yuki. I found that out the other day, which is concerning. Um, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, like he's very erratic. And um, although on a good day, he can put in some stunning performances. He's mega quick, so talented. He also became best mates with causing red flags and hitting the wall in qualifying and practice sessions and, um, you know, getting angry when he was going over the pit lane line in Austria and all these kind of little um, hiccups that he was making through the season, which didn't make his life very easy. Um, so I would probably put these guys a bit lower, which, I mean, I feel bad for Pierre, but this we're, we're ranking driver lineups as a duo. So um, 
Bye, mate. You're going a bit further down with Yuki, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's no surprise you, but I've put him first. <laughs> I love Yuki Tsunoda. <laughs> <Florida. laughs> <laughs> no, uh, however much it pains me to say it, yeah, I would probably put them lower than Aston Martin as well, mainly mm-hmm. just for, um, you know, I'm obviously a Yuki fanboy, but I could admit he had a pretty poor season. And, um, you know, still very inexperienced. He needs to have uh, a solid year to to prove and then Pierre's a difficult one because he's been really good uh, since he came back to Alpha Tauri but you never n- know I don't want to like for me I rate him really highly but you never know like just how good the Alpha Tauri was like it's really hard to tell how good the Alpha Tauri was uh, last year because it qualified so well like you say I mean he was like P2 wasn't he in <laughs> Qatar um, but then they they really didn't get many points. I've actually just realised that, that the list so far is just the constructors' title. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, for, for me, I'd actually put Alpha Tari lower than Aston Martin. So Ooh. you keep, come on, interesting. I want to put you first next year. So please, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we'll get on to this next. Uh, position which is alpine at 6.8 out of 10 i'm looking at that and i think that's thrown me as well a little bit because i i I would put alpine maybe a little bit further down in terms of score but not by much but then aston martin and alfred i feel like they all just deserve to be a bit closer together um but alpine is p5 with 6.8 out of 10.6 ahead of alpha tauri um of course fernando alonso had a, a pretty good pretty good year overall had some great performances esteban ocon of course won in hungary um, and had some reasonable performances too. Um, it's it's so difficult. <laughs> it's such a difficult thing to 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 because you then you go well yeah but no but Aston Martin P seven with a four time world champion Sebastian Vettel and Lance Stroll who I think are both very good drivers. Alpha Tauri Pierre Gasly I think was one of the drivers of the season and yet Yuki was a little bit worse. It's so difficult to order these but the fans are like nah there's going to be a huge point six gap between Aston and Alpha Tauri and then Alpha Tauri and Alpine. Um, but yeah Alpine was. It was a car that kind of went back and forward in 2021. It wasn't like it was consistently good. Obviously, we kind of questioned its massive airbox and, and things like that. Like, was that the way to go? It was a very different design to a lot of the other cars. Um, and Fernando didn't exactly have the quickest start to the season. <laughs> it's just like, whoa, where are we going with this one? P5, is that about right? Mate, yeah, I guess so. You know, because Esteban won a race and Fernando had an amazing podium uh, in... Qatar, is that where it was? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I think it's it's just great. What a great podcast! I don't have a clue. <laughs> like these these numbers Sitting just throw yes. my brain. Yeah, Alpine, AlphaTauri, and Aston Martin. Yeah, they. You could go either way uh, with them, as um, because yeah, Alonso for me. You know how much I rate Fernando Alonso. I think he's really good. Even even. Um, I'd say even uh, like not in his prime, but he's still Fernando Alonso and can just do ridiculous things with a car that shouldn't be anywhere near there. Um, and Ocon is a very uh, confusing driver for me because he <laughs> it's, it's weird to think I, um, for the first time since it actually came out, I watched the first season of Drive to Survive. Um, and it was really interesting that Ocon, was hyped up like this George Russell. He should be in the Mercedes seat ahead of Bottas. He's a future world champion. You had Lewis Hamilton saying he's a future world champion. And then, I don't know, his career's not really gone the way I thought it would. Um, and obviously against Ricardo, he wasn't that great. And the kind of the hype uh, kind of fell off quite a lot. Um, but he's a good, uh, still a good driver. Um but yeah, it's a it's a solid lineup. It actually shows that um, you, you could argue that it shows that despite all the moaning about how Formula One is money, 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 there's some really good drivers in Formula One, which shows how hard it is to actually, you know, do this list that a team uh, that a fifth have a race winner and someone that was hyped up and an amazing uh, junior driver and Fernando Alonso, who's, in my opinion, one of the greatest drivers ever. So, uh, and they're fifth on the list. <laughs> it says, says a lot, doesn't it? 
I definitely think Alpine should be fifth on this list. Um, it's no secret that I I adore Esteban Ocon. I think he's really lovely lad and also a very quick driver. You know, not just his win with Alpine, which you could argue, you know, came in very fortunate circumstances when Valtteri Bottas and Lance Stroll decided they want to go bowling at the start of the Hungarian Grand Prix. But, you know, he still made it work. He, he kept off um, Sebastian Vettel. And I think, although, you know, his teammate helped keep Hamilton at bay as well, he earned that victory and I'm very happy for him. But even before then, you know, he had some good moments with with Renault I mean like look at the secure second place that he managed to get and his elation and happiness in the podium still some of the most wholesome moments and him in the media pen and stuff it's very cute um but also with racing point you know he got a shock um third place qualifying I can't remember which race it was but that was an, a, an amazing result so he's had lots of glimpses of um real promise there and 2021 allowed him to show some of that of course the other side of the scales he also once he signed that Alpine contract till I think it's 2024 which is like a long-term contract you know only a few other drivers on the grid like Verstappen and the clerk have contracts that length um and then it seemed to just be like complete bad luck as soon as he signed that contract his performance just took such a dip um and had a really bad run of results and people questioning if Alpine had made the right call but I think him alongside Fernando Alonso is a really strong lineup. I had my doubts about Fernando at the beginning of 2021. That's not something I shy away from. But um, yeah, they've really come together, made a great team. Um, There seems to be no kind of bitter um, rivalry or, you know, they seem to just be working really well gelling really well together yeah, with wait that. till they have a race winning car. yeah <laughs> yeah for the, for the moment it seems pretty pretty nice and um a good good setup there but yeah i think that they are like a good strong unit and um i'm really interested to see how they get on in 2022 because if they are as competitive as fernando alonso seems to be alluding to um you're that's gonna a be tattoo. a big ch- no yeah. <laughs> no i can't uh, believe you be- agreed to that uh yeah me neither I've, I've been thinking about that every day since i said that on the podcast <laughs> i've been like why did i say that um but yeah i think they're a, a great duo and i think they deserve to be fifth on the list you make a good point actually about I, I kind of forgot um until you mentioned it that if you'd said at the start of the year that because i guess one thing you're not really got into is like how well teammates gel together and how ocon was with perez like the yeah. most crashy teammate and how Alonso is a bit of a teammate killer. I'd have thought there'd be fireworks between these two. And, you know, maybe like, like Matt said that give them a, a winning car when they're on the same bit of road and it's podiums on the line on a regular basis uh, or going for wins, then they're probably not going to be so nice to each other. But I think it's quite surprising actually that, that they did seem to like be this really good um team like they were just really good teammates and uh <laughs> and Ocon you know himself said that you know, all this myth well you say myths about uh, Alonso maybe it's just because you know it's different a different Alonso that he's racing against but yeah that was quite quite surprising because at the start of the year I'd have gone yeah these two are going to fall out <laughs> yeah mm, yeah I still think that and uh, you know the team dynamic changes a lot whenever you get a race winning car but I think if Alpine got a race winning car, Alonso would slot Esteban Ocon straight into his pocket and then he would he would he would do everything to make him his number two, no matter what. Um, but that's something we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, Esteban Ocon. Yeah, it's, it's weird, as you say, Katie, the, the potential, the hype that was was behind him. Um, because I think at this stage in his career, if he really wanted to be in with a shout, maybe in a few years' time to get a top seat he'd needed to have seen off Fernando Alonso, who's come back into the sport. He'd needed to potentially be better uh, against um, Sergio Perez a bit as, as well. I know those two fought quite hard, but then when Perez, Perez now goes to the Red Bull seat, you then see the difference between Verstappen and Perez. So yeah, it's a shame. I think Ocon maybe, we all thought he'd maybe do a little bit better. Um, maybe he took a bit of a confidence dip, uh, dip as well after he was uh, seen with his blue bag over his shoulder leaving Abu Dhabi after losing his seat, sadly. But maybe he'll build up some confidence uh, over the next few years. We'll see. Uh, right. Moving on to number four. And it is McLaren with 7.7 out of 10. 
So nearly a whole point ahead of Alpine. Uh, but they slot in in P4 with, of course, Lando, Norris and Daniel Ricciardo. Oh, hmm. Yeah. Um, does 7.7 do it? I, I think that I think that's a tiny bit high after Daniel Ricciardo's performances last year. Uh, it's going to be unpopular, that opinion. I don't think by much. <laughs> I think that, you know, the low sevens, maybe, uh, you know, Lando Norris was obviously brilliant uh, throughout a lot of the season. But I think Daniel Ricciardo really let down McLaren last year. As much as I absolutely love the man, he's my favourite driver on the grid in terms of personality. He didn't deliver in that McLaren. And it kind of gives cause for concern moving into 22, what he's going to be able to deliver. Because, you know, he wasn't able to, um, you know, jump into a McLaren that was already, you know, very much into the regulations, wasn't able to adapt then. How will he be, be able to adapt to a new set of regulations? That's the kind of worries I have in my head. Mm. Um, he was a lot better towards the end of the season. Was that Lando falling off a little bit rather than Daniel making gains? I'm not sure. But you have to say that Daniel didn't, you know, did improve from the start to the end of the season. But I just felt like, you know, if we're going off recency bias, which is kind of what this whole poll is about, you know, we are thinking about very much the last season, unless we're talking about Sebastian Vettel and Fernando Alonso and their glory days. And yeah, the champions, I think maybe it's a tiny bit high, but not by much. I still think they deserve P4. It is mad, isn't it? Like if you were going through and doing this from the start of 2021, although Lando, you know, the start of 2021, he put in some incredible results, was one of, if not the sort of most hype talked about driver on the grid with what he was managing with that McLaren. Um, But yeah, you'd say, wow, Ricardo and Norris, what a great lineup. And then Danny Rick had his first few races and yeah, he really seemed to to struggle. And that was a theme that continued for most of the season. And, you know, looking at it on paper, Ricardo was a seven-time race win, obviously now eight time with Monza this year or last year. <laughs> Gonna keep doing that. Um, but yeah, it's uh last year with McLaren has really caused a bit of a dent in his reputation, which feels like I feel bad saying it because like you say, everyone loves Ricardo. Everyone's a Daniel Ricardo fan. Even if you say you're not, you secretly are. But um, one of the reasons why so many people get behind him aside from his personality is he's, he's got quite a aggressive uh, driving style. You know, he re- refers to himself as the honey badger. He's the last of the late breakers. He's always, you know, going into a, um, a corner trying to, get the, the, you know, come out of it the other side first and and watching him race when he was at his peak and like Red Bull and stuff like that. It was so entertaining, so fun and, um, you know, great to watch. But yeah, like it's mad to look at this now and think he's actually bringing them down against Lando Norris, who had only been in F1 for a couple of years. He's not even won a race yet, which I know, if you look at uh, Russia, you could say that if the weather gods had not decided to chuck it down with rain, he would have won that race. But um, unfortunately, unfortunately, he didn't. Um, but yeah, it is a it's a strange dynamic because I would, on paper, think Ricardo and Norris would be a stronger pairing than Norris and Sainz, for example. But actually, now having seen the grid have that little reshuffle. I'm starting to think that, yeah, the 2020 lineup of McLaren was much stronger. And that's a team of two drivers that have very limited podium experience or wins or anything like that. But just goes to show what a crazy 2021 season it was. Yeah, it's, we promise this isn't just the constructor's title order because, again, I think <laughs> this is the whole thing so far. Um, but I kind of... Uh, agree with this for, for me mclaren sit sort of in in the bracket of uh this is maybe a bit high uh 7.7 um for me when i look at them comparing it to um aston alpha tauri and alpine um but for me they're not in the the bracket of the the next lot which we'll go into um but yeah, I, I'm the same as you. I can't believe that we're sat here talking about Daniel Ricciardo, uh, a race winner, bringing bringing down the grade against Lando Norris, who had an amazing season, despite um, perhaps not doing as well as uh, people thought um, 
at the end of the season, which I think was pers- personally, I think was a bit uh, of bad luck as as much as it was uh, performance wise. Um, so yeah, M- McLaren. For me, I probably would put them fourth, but I'd put them closer to the Alpines um, rather than closer to the top that they are. Love that. We're in the same opinion. Uh, <laughs> right. So now we move to the top three. Very exciting. Dun, dun, dun. Who is going to get their place? Well, it is Red Bull with 8.2 out of 10. I think I agree with this. Uh, obviously, this is the 2022 lineup. So, of course, Max Verstappen and Sergio Perez once again. I agree with this because Perez wasn't as good as I had hoped he'd be going into the season as a whole. Of course, he did win Max Verstappen the world title. I'm not denying that. You know, the, the amazing defensive driving he did in Abu Dhabi, and he had some great moments as well throughout the year. Uh, of course, you know, winning in Baku and being on the pace then to take advantage of, of Max Verstappen's unfortunate uh, tyre failure. Uh, but over the course of the season, he wasn't quite on the same standard as Verstappen. And, you know, that's very obvious and clear to see that the pace wasn't there. Uh, so that's what, for me, does bring the grade down. I think 8.2 out of 10 is probably about right, in my opinion. Of course, Max, I think, was, you know, a 9.5 or something. But Sergio certainly did bring that down a little bit. So yeah, no, I think P3 is fair going into 2022 when you, it is very much a case of like, there's one team member in some of these that is, is dragging the grade down because you think 8.2 out of 10, you got Verstappen in the team. No way, but it's a collective. And uh, yeah, I think I agree with that. Yeah. Same here. It's, it's because of obviously it's not a spoiler alert because we know the last two teams and, uh, I think the the strongest thing of them is they've got two um, very strong drivers, whereas Red Bull, Perez is a very good driver, but he definitely, like Ricardo has done, because he um, did do quite as well as we expected, brings the grade down. Obviously, uh, you know, Max, in my opinion, is the best driver on the grid with Hamilton, uh, top of the kind of pack, but then Perez... Yeah, he he had a good season. He's definitely better towards the end. So I feel like if he continues that into this year, it'd be like, okay, here's the the press. Because at the end of the day, Red Bull is a tricky one because we know that that second car, you know, we're, we're there applauding Gasly for being incredible. And after his Monza win, we're like, oh, he should go to Mercedes. He's amazing. And you know, he was in that car and couldn't do anything. And Albon couldn't do anything. And Perez. Uh, hasn't maybe uh well he didn't he didn't beat max once on pace uh which you think you know at least one race you might be able to and he's a good driver so um yeah this is this is one i do definitely agree uh with the fans despite my max bias like <laughs> it's not it's not a collective but that's kind of what um has helped max win the the driver's title and could be the thing that helps them next year, you know, the other two teams having two good drivers battling against each other. Maybe this is the advantage for Red Bull as a driver lineup that they do just have one really good driver. We've seen it um, before in the past that it works with like a Michael Schumacher or, or whatever, where, you know, he's just going to get the best out of the car and he can win the constructor's title on his own. So it doesn't matter. Um, maybe, maybe this is the way to go, but yeah, I think 8.2 is a fair, fair rating yeah it's a a funny one because like comparing the the last two that we've got they've both got two drivers which are at the top of their game which is why they're at the top of the charts because they make such a strong duo but it's not to say that Perez is weak and you know it's just all max and Perez is sort of like really struggling and trailing behind because we saw towards the end of 2021 that Perez got comfortable within that team. He was able to make calls to the car to make it more suitable to his driving standards. And um, I'm not sure if that's maybe an age and experience thing where he's, you know, perhaps, and this is just me 
coming up with ideas and scenarios in my head, but maybe with Gasly and Alban, they were so young that maybe they were afraid to ask for things to be set up in certain ways or didn't quite know how to convey how they wanted the setup to be. Whereas Perez, you know, he's been in Formula One for like a decade almost, and he's got so much knowledge and expertise under his belt that he could ask for, you know, ABC to be done to the car and it it was towards the end of the season. Um, I'm not sure why his performance picked up, but I would have some, I would guess it was something to do with, you know, set up and getting more comfortable within that. But yeah, Perez is still a very strong driver, you know, on his day, he can pull off some amazing defending driving and um, all that kind of stuff, hold people back as well. So yeah, I, I think it's right that they're in third. Um, well, obviously Max Verstappen is their reigning world champion now. So it's obviously a very strong setup, but in comparison to the other two, um, that this is the one that's got a dynamic of one driver that is a lot stronger than the other. Not to, like I say, Prez is rubbish or anything. It's, it's just, okay, Katie. You're allowed to say yeah, that Max is better I'm, than you. <laughs> well, yeah, it's but okay. I'm not saying that Prez is rubbish because he's not. It's just no. Max is better. He's indeed. Said music, it, he music, proud. music, music <laughs> to Tommy's ears. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, the person that finished ahead in every single race is the better driver. Uh, but controversial. <laughs> controversial. <laughs> Katie comes out with a shocking opinion. Right. <laughs> now we get to the final two. Mm. In P2 and not winning the driver pole by 0.01 of a point. <laughs> In P2, it is Mercedes with 8.84 out of 10. Of course, the brand new lineup, or at least one and a half, is Lewis Hamilton and George Russell. I think this is a little bit high. I think that we're probably looking at the eight and a half region, in my opinion, uh, for Lewis Hamilton and George Russell. I think, obviously, Lewis Hamilton, you know, we don't need to really go into his accolades, seven-time world champion. You know, let's not talk about 2021 in case you're a Lewis fan. You know, he is one of the best drivers on the grid. He's very much getting towards the stage now where you'd have, you'd expect naturally getting older, his performances are going to start to maybe tail off a tiny bit. Maybe next year won't be that because he will have a fire in his belly if he decides to carry on. We might have to change this rating if he bins off Formula One and we've got Nico Hulkenberg in the seat. But for me, George Russell amaz- had amazing performances in that Williams. You know, he really took that car in certain situations, spa qualifying, for example, and put himself in a position which he did not deserve to be. The one thing that holds me back from giving him like, oh yeah, Mercedes needed nine and a half or whatever, is that we haven't seen him, apart from obviously Bahrain that time where he filled in for Lewis Hamilton. It was a great performance, but he was beating Bottas and also it was one of the easiest tracks to learn. Like I, I, there's still a tiny bit of me where I'm like, I need to see George Russell do this in a top team where he's had the pressure of the whole season on him. You know, now it's time to perform. So looking at that, there's just that tiny bit of, right, I need to see him be a race winner. I need to see him beat, you know, Lewis Hamilton on time to time, like Bottas did when he had his peak at Mercedes a few years ago. So yeah, I think 8.84, maybe a tiny bit high, but they deserve P2, in my opinion. I have quite a different opinion about Russell in that I think that he's going to be, I'm not saying challenging Hamilton, but like from the snapshot that we saw in Sakir, where obviously he covered for Hamilton after he got COVID, I was like flabbergasted at what he was able to do. And that was, that's a big word. (laughs) Um, But, you know, he got called up last minute. I'm sure there was an element of the whole situation where he was like, oh, you know, I've got um, one chance or to quote the great JLS as I used to be a big fan of, you only get one shot, so make it count. You might never get this moment again. (laughs) And, uh, you know, he, he really made the most of it. He had his shoes were too small. He couldn't really fit properly in the car. And yet he managed to pretty much well, nearly beat Bottas in qualifying and then managed to get the lead at the start of the race. And I think without all of the drama of the pit stop shenanigans and then this reported puncture that he had towards the end, he would have beaten Bottas comfortably, won that race. And, you know, he did a great job. And we've just sat here in the same podcast and said how good Bottas is and how he could challenge Hamilton on his day. So I'd like to think that Russell could come in and do 
a similar kind of level with Hamilton. Um, it might take a bit of getting used to. He might be, we've, we've spoken about this countless times on the podcast, but, you know, not wanted to come in guns blazing as soon as we get to Bahrain. He might try and keep his cool a little bit and get comfortable within the team and then start putting in these performances and being really close to Hamilton. But, um, yeah, I have faith that Russell is going to have a good season um, and I'm excited to see what he can actually achieve with a car that is built for him and he's not having to squeeze his huge frame into this tiny little car. I am glad this is a fan voted one because for me, this is so hard to pick. Um, and I, that shows by them being 0.01 apart uh, over thousands of votes. Um, for me, Mercedes probably, if I had to pick, just edges it because I'm clearly British scum and British bias. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, because uh, I agree that Russell, um, he still has something to prove for me on a Sunday. Uh and I know he's obviously in a Williams and he can qualify really well and he can only do so much in that car. Um, but for me, yeah, like some say if we're like comparing the two teams equally, like for me, Sainz uh, is better than Russell. But um, however much I'm not on this Leclerc bashing hype train that seems to be at the moment, Hamilton is a seven time world champion, in my opinion, one of, if not the greatest of all time. So he, Come on, you said that for Fernando just... and now for Lewis. Come on, you can't be cute saying it for everyone. <laughs> well, I can call them one of the, the greatest because that's Max. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you got to say that for him. No, um, uh, yeah, I mean, Hamilton is uh, unbelievably good. So he, for me, he pushes the grade right up. Um, but I'm so excited to see this lineup because, yeah, we've we've been pretty much since uh 2017 2018 where it, we soon realized that Bottas was not going to cha- challenge Hamilton for a, a title uh you know and we had the whole podcast of our oh, you, you didn't realize how much we missed Rosberg until, <laughs> until he went and have someone to push him so yeah it, it will be exciting to see uh, a driver that you hope and a lot of people believe could challenge Hamilton a lot closer and I'm really interested to see what Mercedes do about it. So um, yeah, it's an amazingly amazing lineup and just also a really interesting dynamic that you've got uh, Hamilton uh, at the end of his career, Russell at the start of his career. And it's almost like looped back round almost of, you know, Hamilton was that young driver against a world champion. Uh, and I, I can't wait to see it. Yeah, Can we just start the season like, now, yeah, please? I cannot wait. That, this <laughs> is the most exciting lineup, isn't it? It's the most yeah. exciting yeah. lineup by by a mile. Just to yeah. see where does George Russell stack up against Lewis Hamilton? We didn't think we'd ever see it. We all expected it to be Bottas once again, boring, and then Hamilton will eventually retire. But we don't get that. We get we get a, a showdown. You know, George Russell very much wanting to prove himself. Uh, so yeah, Ferrari are the winners of this poll by zero point zero one. Uh, with 8.85 out of 10. And yeah, I, I agree. You know, you, there, there's arguments for both sides um, in terms of uh, the, the driver lineups between Ferrari and Mercedes. Uh, it depends how much you believe in George Russell's ability and, and how much you think uh, they all need to prove. You know, when we look at Ferrari as well, you know, Charles Leclerc no doubt has unbelievable talent. I think he is still very error prone and can make mistakes. We've seen that. Uh, and as I'm saying this, I'm now thinking Ferrari deserve to be just behind Mercedes. Um, but then on the on the flip side, I think those two drivers are s- on such a level where I think in 2022, if they have a decent car, they will push themselves even further forward. And Carlos Sainz proved that he has the pace to match Charles Leclerc. I don't think over the course of a season he's maybe as good as Charles Leclerc. I know he beat him in the standings, but you know there's plenty of different variables if you want to dive into that. But as a team, I think they are the most exciting lineup in terms of future potential and going into 22 as teammates as well. You know They've, they've had that year together. They're going to con- constantly learn. You can tell that I'm very much on the Ferrari hype train for next year. Uh, th- sorry, this year. Uh, <laughs> it gets shot every time we get yeah, the years wrong. Yeah, literally get the My years goodness. wrong. You can tell, but uh, it's nearly, gosh, nearly the end of January, Matt. Get it together. But yeah, I, I, you can. I can see the arguments both ways. 
am I going to stick with my guns and say Ferrari are the most uh, exciting and potentially best lineup for this year? Yes, I am going to stick with it, but it is marginal. And uh, please don't hate me. I am fanboying and I will fully accept that. Yeah, it is, it's so close, this one. Um, we, we did a graphic recently of uh, pick two drivers for 100 million and, and a, we put like different tiers of like race winners, champions, blah, blah, blah. And um, I looked at that uh, graphic a few times and, and it kept coming back for me that Leclerc and Science were two really good drivers to pick in it. And it just shows that, you know, it's just such a good lineup. And I think the one thing they've got over um the mercedes lineup uh, is two drivers that yeah are going to push each other but they've also got age on their side as well they're both uh you know fairly young not babies but like fairly uh young got a lot of time left in formula one you'd think uh and i'd even say both of them for me are in the top five drivers in f1 uh talent wise so um yeah, really, really exciting. Um, for me, Leclerc has been a bit un, like a bit underrated by a lot of people because of what happened last year. Um, and I think a lot of that, uh, he is definitely error prone, but um, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, the error prone drivers, uh, and I can I can uh, sympathise as a as a Max fan. Uh, and you know, even even like Hamilton this year, when the car wasn't good, he was making mistakes. It's funny how the drivers that are making all these mistakes are the ones that don't have the the machinery quite there. And obviously, Leclerc had a brilliant car, uh, and now he's probably trying to overdrive it to compensate uh, for that gap. And we've seen that with Verstappen, we've seen it with Hamilton, we've seen it with with other great drivers. So um, Leclerc, yeah, brilliant driver. Sainz proved me wrong. I, I. Th- thought he was good but not amazing and he just gets better every year um and has for, for me he's definitely in that top uh well not quite top top but you know he's he's proved to be one of the best in f1 now so um it's such a good lineup and uh yeah i understand why ferrari fans are on such a big hype train because they've got an amazing amazing lineup there Yeah, I think this one, like you say, is so close with Mercedes, but I think it might just pip Mercedes as the best driver lineup on the grid. Um, One thing that stands out with Science and Leclerc compared to, you know, the other drivers that we've got in our top five or top six, top seven even, is that they are the lineup with two drivers that are of similar age and similar experience, which could be why, um, you know, we are putting them on such a level playing field. Because, I mean, if you look at Mercedes, obviously, as you said, Tommy, Hamilton, seven-time world champ, sort of maybe coming towards that end part of his career now, Russell just joining, Red Bull, you've got almost the opposite way around with Max being the younger driver and Perez being the older driver, but it's Max there that, um, you know, it's got the interesting age dynamic. Same with McLaren, um, same with Alpine. I mean, young driver Fernando Alonso, who's just, I think he's, he turned 40 now and Esteban Ocon, who's still very, like, you know, fairly young and Aston Martin has got the same dynamic Alfa Romeo have. Um, but yeah, Ferrari for me um, is just the right balance of, Super fast, talented, maturity as well. Um, you know, they've they've done just enough time in Formula One to get a, an understanding of what is really needed from them. And um, although last season we did see quite a lot of irrational mistakes, whether that's Monaco qualifying. Sorry to bring that up, Matt. I don't mean to cause you to shed a tear at the thought of that. Um, but even with Carlos, you know, he had uh, his fair share of shunts with the wall and normally at the most inconvenient of times, I know you could argue, I guess, in the race is quite an inconvenient time, but, you know, right before qualifying in FP3, he had a shunt with the wall. I think it was in uh, Zandvoort um, and a few other um, knocks and bashes as well. But um, I'm hoping that they've got out their system and if they can erase those mistakes and they've got this amazing power unit behind them that they've upgraded and um, this fresh clean slate that yeah, Ferrari could be, could be the team to beat. I kind of want to change my mind now. Oh, hello. (laughs) You want to come on the Ferrari hype train? Uh, Come come with us. It's so difficult. 
it, it's so difficult. Do-do. I think what what I'll say is if um, get returned. I, I'll still I'll still go with Mercedes as the better lineup. But if I was starting a a team now and had to like pick a team for like longevity and future and everything, I think Ferrari are looking in the best shape. Well, I should hope so. Otherwise, Hamilton's going to be about forty-five by the time you've uh, developed. I wouldn't, wouldn't put so. it past him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, if you've if you've been watching live, Team WTF One, thank you uh, to you guys. Um, you've witnessed the biggest jinx in history, probably, as Ferrari come out and be the eighth slowest Hass team. Are going to win? Yeah, yeah. Hassel champions Hass- confirmed. Yeah, can't wait. Um, so there you go. That is the the rating. So it goes Ferrari, Mercedes, Red Bull, McLaren, Alpine, Alpha Tauri, Aston Martin, Williams, Alfa Romeo, and Haas are the uh, top 10. So I say top 10, like there's any more. There's no more teams. But yes. So uh, there you go. Ferrari win. So I'm ready. They've had their first win of the year. And I am <laughs> totally buzzing about that. Uh, Tommy, final thoughts? Yeah. Um... <laughs> Uh, wow, please, please. that's got to be your worst final thought. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's so little to. Uh, there's so little to, to say. So uh, little going on kind of everything. Yours. Yeah, uh, please vote for us in that podcast thing. If you can get the website to work, oh, you're just going to use that every single time <laughs> yeah. until the voting closes. Brilliant, Katie. Um, I also don't have a. Come thought. on, you have all these thoughts about these teams, but as soon as I ask for one more thought, you're like, nah, yeah. Um, anything, Katie, <laughs> really, literally anything. So, this is what it's like. Wow, well, it's a start uh, Lots of teams have announced their dates for launching their cars. Is that a final thought? What about your th- thoughts? Like, just I am excited for the car launch. It's not news just in. My final thought <laughs> I'm is I'm getting reports. <laughs> I'm excited for the car launches. There you go. I, I will write your final thoughts from here on in. So you can just be my What robots. are your final thoughts? Man? My yeah. final <laughs> thoughts are, wow, can't believe it's two months till the start of the season. It, I need it to be closer. I, I, I've kind of said at the it's end of the season, I'm ready to have a bit of a break. Now I'm ready for all the controversy and carnage again. I just, I, yeah, it's about three weeks. Fine. Any more than that, I'm not I'm not happy. Of course, I accept they need to have a break, but I just need it back. So thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. Hashtag WC1 Podcast if you want to get involved in the conversation, as always. And uh, that is pretty much it. We are available on all platforms, so please give us a like, comment, subscribe, or wherever you, wherever you are. doesn't matter. Oh, I've thought of something. You can, I think you can uh, rate podcasts on Spotify now, so do that. Please do. You, yeah. Ooh, please rate okay. it. Tell us your final ten thoughts. Out of ten. That'll be great. <laughs> Give us your final thought in the uh, comments of wherever you are. So that is it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to Team WTF1 for watching along live, as I say. And uh, we'll see you very soon for another podcast. Bye. Bye. Frank. Bye. Yawn if Charles Leclerc will be world champion. <laughs> 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 <Yes>. <laughs> Yes, two wins in this podcast. Let's go. 